All right. Thanks for coming. Um, before we begin, let's uh, do a few reminders. Number one, please silence your phones and or noisemakers. Um, just be polite for everyone. And number two, please uh, don't forget to fill out the surveys in your email. Um, don't forget to check your spam folder because sometimes it goes there. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's, uh, I guess we'll begin. All right, good morning everyone and thanks for coming. Welcome to Solving Titan-Sized Problems, Evolving Titan Combat in Titanfall 2. My name is Carlos, and I am a game designer at Respawn Entertainment. Um, before that, I was at Infinity Ward, and before that, I was a company called Shell Games. Click, click. Um, here are some of the past projects I worked on, most notably, of course, Titanfall 2, which the game we'll be talking about today. A um, couple more things before we begin. Um, first, as you all know, video game development is a messy process. And while this talk may make it seem like we just figured everything out, you know, just like that, this is really, uh, the reality is a lot of these lessons are a result of trial and error, and we're only really able to organize them in this manner after, you know, all the dust has settled and we can go take a look at what we've done. Um, second, making games is a team effort, and while I'm the guy standing in front of you giving this talk, a lot of what is in this talk represents the hard work of the different teams that, you know, put their work into the, uh, the game. So with that, let's get started. <clears throat> Button. So what's this talk going to be about? Um, in this talk, I'll be discussing how we evolved Titan Combat in Titanfall 2 and how we tackled the problem of combat in a high time to kill shooter. We're going to be breaking down the talk into three major sections. The first section is the introduction to the problem, where we'll talk about um, kind of try, trying to insert a high time to kill game, or trying to insert low time to kill shooter sensibilities into a high time to kill game, um, and what problems can crop up with that. Um, the second part, we'll go into the solutions that worked for us in Titanfall 2, and you know, we'll start how with how we attack this problem in multiplayer and then move on to how this affected single player. <clears throat> Finally, we'll discuss some pitfalls that we came across or problems that we you know, might, have, might not have completely figured out. <clears throat> Real quick, let's talk about Titanfall 2. What is Titanfall 2? For those who don't know, Titanfall 2 is a first person shooter set in the far future in which players play as pilots. Oh God. Agile soldiers that can wall run and double jump around the battlefield. And during the course of a match, pilots can call down Titans, huge war machines designed for destruction, and manually control them on the battlefield. So Titanfall is really a mix of both low time to kill gameplay in the form of pilots and high time to kill gameplay in the form of Titans. Um, and a funny story, just for the purposes of this talk, I realized you know, when I talk about high time to kill, most people will think about games like Halo and Overwatch. So just for the purposes of this talk, when I actually say high time to kill, I'm talking more of a 20 second or greater time to kill, as opposed to something, a game like Overwatch or Halo or Team Fortress, which lives in a more like five to 10 second time to kill. Um, so I guess in the real world, we would call something like Titan Combat extreme high time to kill if we were to stick with high time to kill for Team Fortress and Overwatch. But you know, like I said, I realized that a little late, so just for this talk, that's what high time to kill means. <clears throat> okay, so now that that's out of the way, let's begin by talking about what exactly the problem is we're dealing with. At the beginning of Titanfall 2, Titans were identified as an area in which the, great, the game could greatly expand. With mobility no longer being unique to the franchise, Titans were seen as a greater key differentiator that could really set us apart. The problem was that internally, Titan gameplay was largely seen as um, boring or lacking depth. Um, people would usually throw out the word mushy as a way to describe Titan combat, and references to Rock'em Sock'em robots were often, I hate you, you're not playing my GIF. <laughs> but, um, Rock'em Sock'em robots was often brought up as a, uh, as a point of reference for Titan fights. 
So if we were really to push Titan gameplay, these would be the biggest problems to solve. So we started asking ourselves, why? Why does Titan gameplay feel so mushy? Why does it lack depth? So it seemed to have all the pieces, um, guns that felt good, and rockets, and dashing, and the Titans even moved quickly and in an agile manner, so it felt better to drive around in a Titan. Um, so we got back to basics and really started asking ourselves some hard questions. Questions like, where does shooter depth come from? And we know that gameplay depth can come from having interesting decisions, so where would the interesting decisions come from in a shooter? So the model we came up with, and most of you, you know, in one way or another might be already familiar with this, is that shooters tend to give players different layers of decisions that they're making. And these are broken down by the amount of time players have to make those decisions. So we've identified three key layers that most of the decisions can fall into. There's the atomic layer, which lives in the sub-second space. The, oh, I hate you so much. <laughs> the tactical layer, which lives in the 10-second space. And the strategic layer, which lives in the five to 10-minute space. So we'll look at each one of these layers real quick. Atomic decisions um, live, again, they, these live in the sub-second decision-making space, and they involve the player identifying a target on screen and then deciding how to move their cursor over the target, which means deciding how they're gonna move their thumb on the thumbstick, and then deciding when to pull that trigger, hopefully killing the target. And these types of decisions are happening at a split-second interval, so you're not really always conscious that you're making these decisions but they are there. Um, and these types of decisions have to do with what we call twitch skill or hand-eye coordination. So you get better by practicing and building muscle memory. <clears throat> Tactical decisions happen at around 10 second-ish intervals. And usually these happen when players have just spawned in or maybe when you just finish clear an area in a team deathmatch setting. Um, and these decisions will often involve the player assessing the current state of the map where am I, where are the enemies, or where do I think the enemies are, and then deciding on, the, on his engagement approach. Okay, so if I'm over here, and the enemies are up in that tower, and there's two ways to get to that tower, they're probably looking at the main road, because there's a window over there, so I'm gonna take this other road, um, and hopefully catch them by surprise. And these types of decisions often have to do with what people often refer to as map knowledge. So the more you know about the map, the better you can be at making these decisions. <clears throat> Finally, strategic decisions happen over a much longer timeline, sometimes over once per match, but sometimes also in the middle of the match. Um, and these decisions often involve things like loadout selection or team composition. Um, so you, like I said, normally you, you're familiar with these, you'd select them at the beginning of the match, but it, for example, in a team deathmatch scenario, it can happen in the middle of the match, say, when I go on a, like, a bad losing streak or bad death streak, I might have to reassess my loadout and then go change it and change my strategy. Um, <clears throat> so, re and really another good way to think about all these layers is like the atomic layer will revolve around thinking about this next bullet that I'm gonna fire and the tactical decisions are thinking about what's the next fight I'm gonna have and the strategic decisions are thinking about like what's the next three, four, five, six, seven fights I'm gonna have. So what we really have is this kind of food pyramid of interesting decisions. So you note know that the atomic scale decisions are all the way at the bottom, for shooters specifically, because these are the decisions you're making, you're making a lot of these decisions at a time or per game, right? So for every five atomic decisions you're making, you're maybe making only one tactical decision and so, made up numbers, but you kind of get the idea, right? There's way more at the bottom than there is at the top. So when we apply these layers to, to thinking about Titan combat, the most apparent problem is that high time to kill, or high TTK, it, works, it really works against the atomic layer decisions. Um, and to illustrate, imagine we have our low time to kill shooter. I'm playing this game. There's my cursor. I find a guy that I want to kill. So now I'm deciding in my brain, my brain is fully engaged in moving my, my deep, my thumbstick to try to get this cursor over the guy, and I'm moving it, and now I'm trying to figure out when I'm gonna pull this trigger, 
and I pull the trigger, and then he's dead, which means I can move on to my next decision. Or if I fail, then it's more likely that I'm dead, and I can move on to my next decision anyway. Um, con con contrasting that with something like a high time to kill game, the same thing that happens, I move my cursor over the guy, there he is, I make a decision to pull the trigger, and then nothing happens, so I guess I'll just keep this trigger held, and now I'm not really making any interesting decisions, I'm just retaining the last decision that I make, and nothing's prompting me to make a subsequent decision. And that can lead to boredom and frustration, and this is what people commonly refer to as the bullet sponge problem, aka why bullet sponges are boring to fight. Um, and in Titanfall, this is exacerbated even more by the fact that Titans take up a huge amount of screen space. So even putting your cursor over them is a lot less interesting than putting your cursor over a pilot, which takes up less screen space. Um, and so this is really the problem that a lot of high time to kill shooters will rub up against. More people will, oh, sorry, I already said that. So we really need to solve this problem if we were to make Titans more important for Titanfall 2. Real quick, uh, these are some other not as crucial problems that came up during assessment. So looking at the tactical layer, it seemed that Titan combat overall, it, it's got some good tactical depth because our map designers build our standard three lane maps for Titans um, and that makes it so that it's fairly easy to predict where Titan's gonna be and you can have kind of your standard traditional shooter tactical depth can, can be drawn from that. The only difference is that Titans can't jump or climb anything, so they're all really playing on a single plane, so you lose a little bit of depth with that, but overall, it's not the end of the world. On, a, on the strategic front, we noticed that players would often default to what we called dual-purpose weapons, like the XO-16 chain gun, which is a rapid-fire hit-scan weapon. Uh, and the reason for this is that in Titanfall, you're, not, you're never really sure whether you're gonna come up against a Titan or a pilot, so it turned out to be more advantageous for you to bring a weapon that could just handle both, um, both, at, both types of enemies, um, so it turned out to be safer, so most people ended up picking that we weapon, and so that was kind of our weapon meta for Titanfall 1. So we'll be touching on these along the way, but the real problem to solve with regards to high TTK has to do with the atomic layer. Okay, so now that we have a greater understanding of the problem, we can start figuring out how we're going to solve it. <clears throat> so first we'll talk about how we went about solving this in multiplayer. We decided it would, it would be better to start solving the problem in multiplayer because it's much easier to apply multiplayer depth to single player rather than the other way around. Single player tends to use AI logic as somewhat of a crutch, um, you know, forcing AI to do certain things so that it helps the player or challenges the player in certain ways. So it, but it's almost impossible to force players to do what an AI is doing, whereas it's much simpler to make an AI pretend to be a bad player. So first, I want to talk about specific things that we brought back from Titanfall 1. You know, it wasn't all bad, so here's some things that we, dis, we, you know, we looked back and we decided we wanted to keep. Um, the first is the concept of weak spots, which is basically our equivalent of headshots for Titans. So similar to the headshot concept, this creates a high-risk, high-reward zone that the player can aim for, which helps him with the atomic layer. It, it helps him give like a higher skill, higher uh, way to express a higher skill over other players. That is, gives him higher risk. Um, the problem with weak spots in Titanfall 1 was that they were only present when a Titan's shield was lowered. So most of the time you encounter a Titan, the weak spots wouldn't even be showing, and you have to take down their shield. So you have this portion of gameplay where the weak spots don't exist, and then they exist. So that was a problem for Titanfall 1, which we, uh, by removing shields in Titanfall 2, we were able to expose the weak spots more often. The second thing we carried over from Titanfall 1 was the concept of dashing and blocking as a form of damage mitigation. So this video isn't playing. Wait, are you serious? Oh, there you go. Oh, my God. So these skills, we were able to add on to the atomic layer but they were not viable due, the, due to the presence of hitscan weapons like the XO-16, which made it, you know, impossible to dash. But we'll, we'll talk more on that later. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so moving on to Titanfall 2, the first thing we did was we tried to figure out if any other multiplayer shooters have solved the high time to kill problem. And we came up uh, fairly empty handed, so if anyone has any ideas, you know, I'd love to talk about it after the talk. Um, so instead, we looked at other genres like Street Fighter and MOBAs, and we said, hey, these games, you know, they have high time to kill and they have good depth, so maybe we can learn something from these games. Um, so trying to find the commonality between the two, you know, it being pretty obvious that these, both of these types of genres have the idea of preset characters or classes. And once we kind of unlocked that discovery, it became really clear that having Titans be preset characters was going to be a really good fit because for high time to kill, you know, it, it takes advantage of the increased face time between players. And not only that, but the problem we were having of Titans taking up a lot of screen space is now all, also somewhat of a strength since you have that much more screen space to visualize them. And so this is how that turned out. So obviously the nice thing with having Titan classes too is now we can kind of give players these common mech fantasies that uh, are pretty popular. So like we have the fire Titan, we have the Titan with a sword, we have a laser Titan, we have a Titan that can fly. So um, in a way it, was, we, it also helped us kind of achieve fantasy fulfillment for the players. But the real win with Titan classes was that high time to kill means you have more time to assess what an enemy, who an enemy is and think about what tactics he might employ. Um, and a lot of games like Team Fortress 2, they'll talk about the necessity of this snap read, which is that players need to be able to identify their enemies in a split second, thereby increasing the importance of distinct silhouettes for them. And for us specifically, our fights lasted so long that the snap read wasn't even like 100% essential. I mean, we still strive for good silhouettes at the end of the day, but during dev testing, all we had to do was put the names over the guy's head and it was you know, good enough. It was, it was readable enough for, for in kind of internal testing and it helped us kind of develop really quickly. Um, in addition, high time to kill also means now that players now actually have plenty of time to think about how they can combo their abilities. And as a good example, um, one of the Titans, Scorch, has, a, has an ability called the Incendiary Trap, which she can throw out and ignite. And this on its own doesn't do anything. Um, it just sits there, and it, but it requires Scorch to light it up with his main weapon. And this is the type of ability that you would never ship in a low time to kill shooter because it's really inefficient. Like, you're, you're just better off pointing your gun at the enemy and shooting him. Um, having fixed loadouts also meant that abilities didn't have to directly compete with each other for players' loadout selection. So in an a la carte system, what would normally be on your right bumper, you know, if you had four selections, four weapons there, normally you would want to balance all of them in such a way that their power level was pretty similar, because otherwise players would just pick the best one all the time. Um, but in a, in a fixed loadout system, my right bumper ability could be weaker than someone else's right bumper ability because you could technically transfer that power somewhere else. So someone could have a weaker right bumper but then a stronger primary or a stronger um, defensive ability and so on and so forth. Uh, it, also, oops, it also allowed us to create more niche abilities that weren't necessarily useful in every single situation. 
And since we we're going down the road of fixed loadouts, we wanted each Titan's abilities to synergize with each, with each other. This creates depth by allowing players to discover the different ways that they can use the Titan's abilities. So we wanted to make sure that all Titans were thematically matched, um, but also that all their abilities kind of, were, you, you would be able to, to, be, to think about how you could use one or two or three abilities together. But we still need to address the atomic layer problem directly. And to do this, we found that staying away from rapid fire weapons actually benefited that layer. Low frequency, high damage attacks create spikes in the flow of the fight where players can have small moments of success and failure. So this also mimics kind of the low time to kill dynamic since the acquire aim fire loop is completed after each shot is made since the lack of rapid fire capabilities means that the player needs to reacquire the target after each shot. <clears throat> so this also allows for a better, better rhythm in the fight since it creates pauses between the shots so players can have time to assess the situation between each of his, each of his enemy's shots. So let's take a look real quick. First, so we're going to take a look at two videos re real quick. The first video is from... Uh, is, uh, is the XO-16 chain gun, the infamous XO-16 chain gun, the kind of gameplay that comes out of that. So in that video, you'll see the guy with the XO-16, he's just running around pointing the gun at his enemy, and there's really no new decision points that, that he's triggering, other than the fact that when maybe, A, when he reloads, you know, he might think about taking cover then because he can't DPS at that point, or B, when his enemy pulls up a shield, because then he might think about, well, that enemy can damage me, but I can't damage him, so maybe I should break away. But as far as his aiming and shooting, it's fairly uninteresting. You can see he's just pointing and then just casually turning and nothing's really changing. Now let's contrast that with the next video, which is our more low frequency attacks. So in this one, you can see after each shot, he's having to reassess what he's doing, reacquire his target, which makes for a more interesting kind of play pattern for his primary weapon. But that doesn't mean that we don't have rapid fire weapons, because the good thing about rapid fire weapons is that they're really good for new players. Um, it's re they're really easy to use, so it provides a way for new players to get into your game and immediately start having fun. So we didn't want to completely give up that accessibility. But what we did was we made sure that the Titans that had rapid fire weapons would have something else in their loadout that could compensate and create depth. So a good example is the Titan Ion. He has, his primary weapon is a rapid fire rifle, um, but his right shoulder, but the, sorry, let me do that again. His primary weapon is a rapid fire rifle, but it's really weak. And his secondary, which is a shoulder laser, is a one-time kind of high impact skill shot that deals a lot of damage. So that's so as an ion player, you're gonna you're really you're really using your splitter rifle to just kind of throw jabs at your opponent, but what you really want to do is hit him with your strong laser. And so here's what that looks like. So in this video in particular, actually, you'll see the first laser shot was missed, and that was pretty crucial. Like, if he would have hit that laser shot, this Titan would have been doomed, and then he could have gone in for the execution. Um, as mentioned previously, blocking and dashing was something we carried over from Titanfall 1, but we realized that this only really works 
when everyone's weapons are projectile based. Uh, projectile weapons have travel time, and that time is essential for players to be able to respond to it. So combining projectile weapons with slow fire weapon designs, um, damage mitigation becomes a much more viable concept in Titanfall 2. Next. But projectile weapons tend to be really difficult to use, especially combined with the fact that many of our weapons were not rapid fire. So to help with this, we have tech called fat projectiles that we can apply. Uh, and what this does is it gives our projectiles width, making it easier to hit targets with them. Um, the nice thing with this tech was that it was also used for pilot weapons, and it allowed us to create non-hit scan weapons for pilots that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the assault rifle. But hit scan can still exist, and a good example of this is one of the Titans Legion who has a minigun. Um, but his minigun has a built-in spin-up time, so that compensates for the lack of travel time in his projectiles. And we do a lot of work to change his silhouette depending on his weapon state. So players can easily read whether or not he's ready to fire. In addition, this also makes positioning way more important for a Legion player. So we kind of accept that he'll have less engaging atomic decisions, but that's okay since we've traded it for an increased dependence on his tactical decisions. Video. Um, another thing that we did was design abilities that created permanence on the battlefield. Scorch's loadout in particular features abilities that linger for some amount of time, so it forces his opponent to constantly kind of rethink his position, or it pushes his opponent out of position. And something we realized was that abilities, or sorry, sorry rather, something we realized was that Titan fights would often last a long time, and Titans would often play in the same space. So having something that can change the meaning of that space would help keep those fights fresh. Um, some ex other examples of this, of permanence that we made were the cluster missile, particle wall, uh, the, uh, uh, Scorch's incendiary trap, or the laser trip mines for ion. So, but static permanents are good, but we found that permanents that move in a slow, predictable path are even better. So the slow moving part is important because you want these permanents to last a good amount of time on the battlefield, or enough time that players can react to them in a meaningful way. So if they move too quickly, they'll end up hitting a wall or flying by your opponent, and then they're basically gone at that point. And we came upon this discovery when we made this ability called the Arc Ball, which oddly enough didn't ship as a Titan weapon. Um, the Arc Ball, or the Thunderbolt, which as a pilot, though that's the pilot version of this weapon, but this specifically is the Arc Ball. Um, this is an ability that launches a slow-moving projectile. Can you see my pen? No, you can't see my pen. Can you see my cursor? So this is our slow-moving projectile, as you can see. And you can see it's, this projectile kind of zaps the opponent that's within range of it. Um, so when we playtested this, we found that it really added an extra kind of uh, an extra layer that would really change the, the, the dynamic of the fight, but only for a certain amount of time. So here's what that looks like in practice. If this video would play. Maybe if I click. Salvo call ready. So you can see in, those, in that video, there's multiple ways to kind of use the arc ball, not just to damage your opponent, but to force him into certain bad situations that you can take advantage of. And this kind of mimics, hopefully this GIF will play. Oh, I hate you so much. 
Yes. So this mimics what in Street Fighter people, um, the slow fireball in Street Fighter, which players can use to, um, I think they call it fireball zoning. So what it does is it forces their opponents to react to the fireball and possibly put themselves in a bad position. Um, finally, the last element that we worked on was improving our Titan's core abilities. In Titanfall 1, core, or sorry, in Titanfall, core abilities are essentially supers or alts. They are ultra low frequency moves that can have a high impact on a battle. Titanfall 1 had core abilities, but they were mostly things like double damage or increased health, which were okay, but they didn't really create the spikes in gameplay that you would want from, a, from an ultra low frequency attack. For Titanfall 2, we had to rethink our core abilities to be more attack-like with the goal of having them create opportunities to tip stalemates or create reversals. One thing that we wanted to make sure when designing these abilities, though, was that they weren't instant win buttons. We still wanted the notion of allowing players to express skill when using these core abilities. So there's the idea of being able to use a core ability poorly and being able to use it well. The best example of this is Ion's laser core, which has wind-up time to warn the opponent that it's going to happen, when it, and when it activates, the attacker has slowed movement, and he has disabled dash and a slowed turn speed. So a player has to make a judgment on whether or not it's a good time to use that ability. Uh, this also opens up a new type of gameplay, which is commit and punish, which is something that you find in fighting games a lot. So when, in fighting games, when someone does a specific move, a character will com commit to a certain movement and could possibly expose himself um, that can, and that the enemy can exploit. So here's what that looks like for us, if the video would play. Ion laser core activated. Ion laser core activated. We're not ahead by much. Let's pick up. <coughs> <Just a> sec. <coughs> <coughs> Ugh. Mm. So what we're really doing here with all these changes is we're trying to create new decisions for the player to make outside the atomic layer. So we kind of just made this new layer, which for now I'm calling the technique layer. And the technique layer is this loop of decisions that occur in roughly two second windows. And they have to do with assessing the current board state, so not the whole map, but just this fight in front of you, um, and thinking about what abilities you have, what abilities the enemies have, and then executing your next move. Uh, somewhere in there, you're also thinking about you know, your cooldowns and trying to figure out you know, whether or not your next av available ability is something that you can possibly combo your current abilities with. Um, and this layer is sort of present in low time to kill shooters, although it's very underplayed. And it's present in the form of grenades as a pre-engagement attack. So in a low time to kill shooter, if I know that there's an enemy in the next room, I could throw a grenade in there and increase my chances of winning that fight by pushing the enemy out of position prematurely and then going in knowing that he would be out of position when I walk in. Okay, so now that we've built our combat depth in multiplayer, we can fairly easily, or you know, we can apply this uh, depth to single player. So, when we started working on Titan Combat in single player, our first instinct was just to assume everything would work great. We spawn a bunch of Titans, we you know, lay out combat the way we normally do, no problem. However, we ran into the problem of combat fatigue, where players would often get pretty tired after a Titan fight. So to solve that, we experimented with what we called weak Titans. And that's a concept where presumably we would say that auto Titans would be easier to kill than, say, piloted titans. And, you know, when we implemented it, at first it felt great, you know? I go play a fight and I kill a bunch of weak titans and then eventually, once in a while, I'll, I'll fight like a non-weak titan. Uh, and so, 
you know, people were reporting that they were having fun. Um, but, you know, we let this sit after some, you know, we let it sit for a couple months. And after further inspection, we realized that being able to mow through a bunch of Titans in a row, it really made field Titans feel, you know, weak. Um, and like they weren't special anymore and they're too disposable. Um, in addition, we had all these cool behaviors from multiplayer that weren't being showcased because the Titans would die so easily. So we scrapped that idea and instead split the difference. We increased the health back to their original values and then pushed the differences in health. So that's our MP health, and this is what the health values look like in single player. So the light chassis has around half the health of its multiplayer counterpart, and the medium chassis has around 80% health. Now, a 50% light chassis health, is, it's still a decent amount, so they can definitely still have some time to use their abilities. Uh, at 50% health, I believe fighting a Ronin on average still takes the player around 15 or 12 seconds. So this allowed, but, bleh. This also allowed designers to tune fights a little bit better. So if you wanted a, an easier fight, you would drop a, um, a couple of light titans like a Ronin or a North Star. And we found that good fights usually were comprised of maybe one heavy titan with a couple of light titans backing him up. Um, but in general, we still found that fights were pretty tiring, so we needed, we needed to break up Titan fights even further with kind of infantry sections or Reaper sections. So if you don't know what a Reaper is, he's kind of like a half Titan. He, he's got like tw uh, one, chunk of, one chunk of this health, uh, and he's half the height of a Titan, so he, he can die pretty quickly to a Titan. Um, so so these, these kind of inter uh, infantry sections proved to, proved to be good not just to break up the fights, but to sell the scale of Titans as well. Because if I'm a Titan and all I come across are big Titans, I don't really get the sense that I'm this giant robot. I just, everything's my size, so whatever. So since we ended up with high-ish health Titans, we generally tried to have Titans fights be like 1v1 or 1v2, 1v3, and this allows players to focus on the enemy titans more, since we also found that players had a lot more face time with enemy titans than in low time to kill games. So this increased face time means that we had all this time to play with, so we used it to give enemy titans more personality. It was a good opportunity to kind of build a relationship between the player and the enemy he would be fighting. And to do that, we wrote a system called the VDU system that would detect player actions and make enemy titans respond accordingly. The idea was that when you were fighting an enemy titan, that titan's pilot would have an open communications line with you and he would taunt you and stuff. So it would do things like, when the player damages an enemy a certain amount, he would respond by saying, oh, how dare you? Um, or if the player used his core ability, you know, the enemy would say something about that too. Militia titan spotted, chassis number BT7274. Sorry, but this is your dead end, pilot. All right, let's end this quick. So real quick, let's talk a little more about our Titan AI. Um, again, since players are now spending more time with each enemy, they have a lot more time to notice AI behaviors, so it became worthwhile to invest in a more robust AI system. Um, in designing our AI Titans, we, we decided to go the route of Street Fighter bot fights, 
So we like that when you fight against a bot in Street Fighter, um, all kind of normal thought processes that you would go through when fighting a player still applied, uh, more or less, to fighting a bot. So our Titan AI generally tries to act like a player, and they follow the same rules as a player. They'll only block or dash once you've fired, and having projectile weapons again here will help, because they can take advantage of that travel time to make that decision. Um, they also follow the same cooldown rules for their abilities, so it's, also so it's also possible to bait certain abilities out of an enemy and then counter with your own attack. Uh, nice thing is these Titans are used both in multiplayer and single player, um, but single player just adds a layer of characterization on top of the multiplayer AI. The last thing I want to talk about is our AI boss battles. In Titanfall 2, spoilers, Players will fight a number of boss characters, which are the different mercs that Blisk has hired to help him. Due to time constraints, we didn't have enough time to hand script each boss battle, like how we would usually think of a traditional boss fight. Instead, our bosses just use the same system as our other titans, but they're just more aggressive about using their abilities. And what I mean by that is that our normal titans will usually wait a little bit after their ability is ready before they actually use it but our boss titans will use to try to use their abilities as soon as they're available. <clears throat> but we still wanted to make our boss battles feel more special, and there are a few things we did for that. So one is all our bosses have these cool intro, showcase, intro cutscenes that showcase their personality, and with the exception of a few special cases, this is the only time we actually see cutscenes in Titanfall 2. Two, bosses have regenerating shields just like the player. Not only does this make them harder to fight or deal damage to, but it also enables them to act just a little bit smarter than other titans, since they'll also try to preserve their shield. So a boss titan will try to retreat behind cover to, get to, to try to get his shield back. Bosses also have Doom State, which is an extra layer of health that puts a titan in kind of an executable state. And we removed this for our normal titans because, again, it extended their health too much. But it seemed appropriate for bosses to have. Um, the nice thing is this also makes it so that bosses are the only, ones that, only titans that can get executed, and each boss actually has a special execution animation tied to him. Finally, boss titans have extra VDU callouts that they can use, and they have a special pool of just taunt dialogue that they can say if they, you know, if they haven't said anything in a while. So they'll call out... In addition, they'll also call out if they're being aggressive or defensive, so they seem just a little bit smarter. Um, so let's see what that looks like. You were not invited to Kane's party, and that's why you're dead. <laughs> well, well, another runaway hero with an SRS Vanguard class type. Woo! Now we're talking. <laughs> Bring it night. Let's get this party started, Scrub. Walk away, Scrub. Just walk away. Only a matter of time before I rip you out of that cockpit anyway. Target hit. Fox 8. Nice try, love. But I'm no pushover. Time to die, Clan Amon. All right. I'm ready for more. Goodbye, you little bastard. Overall, I think given the circumstances, it worked out pretty well. 
I think the fact that the bosses actually use normal AI makes our boss fights feel kind of less scripted and more real than the traditional ones. Uh, I do think there's a lot of improvement though, and I think there may be a middle ground where we can have our boss titans use their AI, but designers can script in kind of special events to, to sell the spectacle. And you get a little bit of a glimpse of that in the Viper fight in our game. So the Viper fight is one that was more special scripted because the designer for that really wanted to do it, and he's the one that flies around and does a special core ability that doesn't appear in multiplayer. Um, so I think in the future, I would try to push more in that direction. <clears throat> Finally, let's talk about the unexpected problems that we ran into in, during development. And you know, some of these problems we haven't even really figured out the solution for, but these are just things to watch out for. The biggest pitfall in the direction we took was that all these different loadouts really increased the complexity of Titan combat. Um, by introducing the skill of ability combos and enemy recognition, we created a potential greater, potentially greater skill gap between players that played the game a lot and know all the characters and the players that don't. And this can be partially solved by good matchmaking so we don't ever put two players of different skill levels in a match together, but matchmaking can only really go so far, so I think more work needs to get put into that. Um, other league games such as League or Street Fighter, you know, they do a lot of work both inside and outside the game to give players access to information about their characters. We did a little bit of this with the intro videos for the Titans, but I think there's still a lot more we can do. Something like a training room or, or a certification course would be ideal so that players have a safe space to practice using their loadout. Um, another thing that added to this was that when we started working on Titans, we primarily focused on making sure players were having good 1v1 fights. And this was all well and good, you know, we built kind of a 1v1 map and we would play test there and just have like really fun 1v1 fights or even 2v2 fights. Um, so this was all well and good, but it was, became really disastrous when we actually played a real match of attrition, a 6v6 match of attrition, since players were having to deal with not just more titans, but the potential of pilots sneaking up on them as well. So this means that we actually had to tone down some of the more obtrusive effects that were again working in a 1v1 context, but were pretty bad in kind of a 6v6 concept, uh, context where anything could happen. Um, so, and a good example of that is North Star's plasma railgun used to apply a really huge knockback effect when you, whenever you would get hit. And this was great in 1v1 since it really helped him force his opponent into his, uh, into his ideal range. But you can imagine when playing a 6v6 match, you can get tagged by a North Star railgun rail out of nowhere, and then all of a sudden you're shifted like 36 un or you know 3,000 units to the left, and you don't really know why. So we had to take things like that out. The other problem that presented itself, um, sorry, the other problem this presented was that we also tuned health values to be again to be interesting in a 1v1 context. Uh, our intention was to make sure that Titan fights you know, had enough time to feel like a real fight, again, looking at Street Fighter fights as reference. In practice, however, we found that whenever two Titans would get into a fight in a real match, they would effectively kind of end up going into their own little corner and play out their fight that took forever, and they would effectively ignore the match. Um, and we had this one, I remember in particular this one event, there was this hard point match, and I, was a I got in my Titan, and we're running around, I tried, and I found another Titan, and we started a fight, and it was, the, the match had already finished, like the victory screen went up, and we were still fighting, and the evac happened, and everyone left, and we were still fighting, and like, we basically just ignored half that match, and so that was, we, we determined that that was not a good thing. Um, so this problem of complexity ex is exacerbated by the fact that you're in a Titan for about only really 30% of the time in Titanfall. So this means that even if you wanted to practice using a certain Titan, you would, only ha you would have to play this pilot game for a while and wait until the next one is available, which is not really ideal. So right now, if you really wanted to practice using a Titan, the, oops, the best place to do it, whoa, let's do that again. The best, so if you really wanted to practice using a Titan, the best place to do that is in Last, last Titan Standing, which is a game mode that always starts you in a Titan. But even that game mode, it's an elimination game mode, so you gotta wait after you die before you can you know, do it again. 
Um, in single player, this is the main reason why we switched to the on-the-fly loadout switching for BT. Initially, players would pick up a new loadout from enemy titans, but we ran into the problem that they might pick out a loadout that they didn't like or they weren't good with, and then they'd basically be stuck with that loadout. And it takes a long, and since it takes a long time to learn a loadout, it really disincentivizes players to seek out new loadouts. They would just stick with the ones they're comfortable with. With the Mega Man style loadout system, players could kind of, kind of try a loadout without the fear that they might not like it, because then they could always switch back to something they're comfortable with. So at some point, at any point in time, they can just kind of dip their toes in and then possibly be better. Uh, also in single player, this pushes us to create a dynamic, dynamic hint system. So what our hint system does is it tries to kind of it detects what you're doing in a fight and kind of takes a lot of data. It tries to figure out how long you've been in a fight, and if you're only using your primary weapon in that fight, it'll signal you to use your other abilities. Um, unfortunately, the system isn't super duper smart yet, so sometimes when you're taking damage, it'll just tell you to use electric smoke um, really, the intention is it tells you to use electric smoke and then take and then go to cover. But people didn't really um, know that all the time, so there's a little bit more improvement we can do for that in single player. Oh, and also we should port that to multiplayer. Um, another specific thing to high time to kill is the problem that it's difficult to communicate to players where they made a mistake. For low time to kill gameplay, we have a feature called Kill Replay which will show the players their final moments before they died. Um, this eight second window is usually enough to be able to show players exactly how they died so they can do better next time. But high time to kill fights could last for you know, a minute and showing the final 10 seconds of someone's life may not reveal anything valuable. Um, in addition, players will often eject out of their Titan instead of dying, so they aren't even in a mindset to absorb that lesson since they're still busy trying to run around shoot shooting other Titans. Um, so this one, we're still unsure of how to solve this, and some ideas have been brought up, like showing a feed of major damage sources, but I think more research needs to be put in, in regards to how we can present this information. As I mentioned in single player, when we started designing combat encounters with these titans, our first instinct was to lay out one fight after another, similar to other shooters we've worked on. But we found that even, just one, even after just one fight, Players got pretty tired since titan, titan fights are a lot more involved than pilot fights. So we had to make a conscious effort to space out Titan fights more and insert infantry combat in between just as a pallet cleanser. The only exception is levels like Trial by Fire and the Fold Weapon, which is this. So this is Trial by Fire. And in this level, you're fighting a bunch of Titans in a row, but we have additional mechanic. We have friendlies in this level, so they can help kind of take tank the damage from other Titan enemies, and they can also deal damage to enemies, so it helps you kind of just push through that level. And in this level, this is the, the last level, the fold weapon, and in this one you also fight like a bunch of Titans, but in this level we have a mechanic with ship bombardment, and that'll bombard all the enemy Titans and basically turn them into weak Titans, because now, now they're all damaged, and you can go mow through all those weak Titans pretty quickly. Um, this is generally less of a problem for our multiplayer, since there are less Titans on the field overall due to the whole pilot, Titan, pilot thing. Um, and in Last Titan Standing, we have natural breaks that are the round transitions, so those are also good cooldown moments. But I imagine if you were to make a multiplayer game that's like high time to kill, all the time, team deathmatch, you would probably run up against this problem as well. Finally, the last problem is more of a Titanfall specific problem, and it has to do with regen health. So regen health is great, because it makes type, you know, it'll force players into this position where they have to retreat, get behind cover, stop, think about what their next thing is going to be. But for Titanfall, it was bad because we needed the Titans to cycle out. Um, we, in Titanfall, we were dealing with this problem called Voltron. And Voltron happens when one team gets four or five Titans together and they just, you know, gang up on one Titan and they obliterate all the other team's Titans. And now the other team has zero hope of, bring, of, of winning the match because every time they bring their Titan in, they just get stomped. Um, and in Titanfall 1, this was a huge problem. Because of regenerating shields, it was very difficult for the enemy team to even damage the Titans. So re removing any sort of health regeneration kind of helped us, uh, 
help the other team kind of bring other Titans down. But again, in single player, we kept regenerating health because that wasn't really a concern. Um, so this is the end of the talk, and then we'll just recap real quick. So high time to kill negates depth at the atomic level. So try to push designs that embrace high time to kill. For us, fixed loadouts fit really well with high time to kill. They push enemy recognition and ability combos, and it fit, that type of stuff fits really well with kind of the increased face time. Um, think about how to add more interesting decisions within and outside that layer. Again, for us, you know, low frequency attacks and permanents were a good step, kind of first step, but there could be more out there. Be ready to handle increased complexity and watch out for combat fatigue. Finally, I just want to point out that when we started this project, you know, high time to kill was kind of seen as a little bit of a problem child, and there was definitely a lot of temptation to lower Titan health values. But I'm really glad that we really embraced the high time to kill nature of Titans as it made us, it really pushed us to create something that I feel is really unique uh, in, terms of shooters, in, in terms of shooters. And it kind of opened up this new design space for shooters where uh, ability design can really flourish and you can have more room to create more weird and kind of cool abilities. Uh, and I, I'm pretty excited for what you know, the future holds for that. So that's the end of the talk. I want to call out just Special shout out to these people up here. They, in per, these people in particular, a lot of their work is also represented in this talk. So Mac McCandlish, who's the lead designer. Uh, Stephen DeRose, who is the other guy that worked on Titans. He really helped push Titans to be you know, super polished and shippable. And then Ji Sang was the AI programmer who worked on Titans as well. And that's all. Uh, I don't know, we have like four minutes for questions. Also, Respawn is hiring. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm wondering if you experimented with damage regions to offer more choices at the atomic level. So like, I shoot off a Titan's arm and it can't use a gun, and I shoot off its chassis and it can't use its core. And if you did experiment with that, why did you not take that? Um, I don't know if we experiment, we didn't experiment with that in Titanfall 2. We experimented with damage regions dealing different amounts of damage, but not like losing your arm, because then you basically would just be walking and then you couldn't play anymore. Yeah. You would like lose a segment of gameplay that would normally be you know, important to you. Um, with regards to different damage values, something interesting that I didn't actually put in this talk was in Titanfall 2, we reduced the amount of damage uh, buffs that the crit point gave you because we found that we were able to put depth in other places. And having variance in the amount of damage you can deal was bad for the guy receiving damage, because he also needed to predict how much damage he was going to receive, and he can't really control where the guy's going to hit him. So, we, so reducing the amount of variance just kind of helped improve the predictability of that. Thank you for the talk. Uh, hi. I was curious, uh, with the balancing of all these six uh, abilities and Titan classes, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you experienced any particular like challenging areas, and uh, if you have any comments on like any stuff you've seen shake out from the players uh, live testing it for you? Um, sorry, could you, would you mind being more specific? I don't think I fully understand your question. Okay, I was just uh, curious how the uh, uh, what your experience was like balancing these six different like Titan classes. Oh, so the question is about um, just in general balancing kind of the six classes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I didn't. I wasn't actually the guy balancing it, just you know, to put that out there. But overall, when, I think when we were making these Titan abilities, it was kind of a weird, it was, especially in its infancy, it was difficult to figure out how many abilities a Titan should have, and which, it, we, there was one point in time where we experimented with sharing, kind of, maybe they should have one slot which had shared abilities. Uh, but it turned out it was just much better if everyone had their own unique thing. And then balancing them, you know, you just play test, and then if a specific thing was too strong, you would pull it back, or if it was too weak, you would buff it. You know, it's all, you're just getting feedback from different players, and you know, as if you've been in Chin's talk, 
mul the multiplayer team play tests every day, and then every week we have Friday night fights, so we get a decent amount of feedback from, uh, from our dev team. And then from the live te game, you know, we, we, look at, we look at the Reddit, obviously, you know, that's kind of a slice of our community, trying to figure out if any metas has emerged, and then figuring out what we, you know, we, we balance the live game as well, you know, we'll, we'll change some numbers depending on what players' activities are. Thank you, great talk. Thank you. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I was wondering in single player if you had any tricks uh, for scaling difficulty without falling into those, some of those same traps of bullet sponges on one end or titans not feeling special on the other end. Um, specifically, well, I think the once you increase the health, it's, so basically what I found is you can, once you start increasing health to bullet sponge levels, wait, is that is your question? Sorry, is your question, if I increase the health to bullet sponge levels, what should I do, or what can I do to not increase bullet sponge levels? I, I was more curious if you had any uh, more creative ideas than just scaling the health, uh, since uh, you pointed out that sort of leads to bullet sponges or titans not feeling special at the other end. Uh, well, there's, what did we do? We did kind of shield usage, which is a little bit of health, but also um, it's just a little bit of extra health that they can regenerate, so it also helps make makes them feel smarter. Um, you can play with how often they dash or avoid damage or block. Um, we had one version of Titan AI when they weren't really tuned where they would use the vortex shield, and they were so good at using the vortex shield, they would vortex your bullets and then fire it back at you, and then you would catch it because you, know, you saw them use it, but then and you fired it back at them, then they would catch it right away and then fire it back at you right away. So you could try to make them just be more aggressive with how they use their abilities too. Uh, I guess things like that. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. That's it, I think we're, that's time. Uh, there's a wrap-up room over there if anyone wants to talk some more, but I think people need this room. Thanks for coming.